this is a place called Pasargade. You're looking at the ruins of the ancient palace of Cyrus the Great. And my friends are pointing to an inscription at the top. Let's get a bit closer and read it. Now his name was mentioned almost two centuries before his birth, as I mentioned before. If you read carefully, if you can read cuneiform, it's, it's written by Cyrus. He says, I am Cyrus, the king of Achaemenid. And it's written in three languages, Elamite, and we're going to discuss something about the Elamites. And the other language is Old Persian and the Akkadian language. So three languages. He was a very considerate king. He wanted everybody to benefit from the translations. So you could read it in Median, Akkadian, Old Persian. Mer. I bought this book when I was there at Persepolis. And I checked the name of the book, the, the, the meaning of Mer and Ma. Mer, important Persian word which means love, affection and son. What a beautiful title for a book. Ma means moon or month in Persian Farsi language. And this is what I brought back from Iran. The land of Mer and Ma. What could these words mean? Sarah suspected all beliefs while keeping his own firmly. These are excerpts from the book. I'm quoting from this book now. He reigns over hearts besides territories. Did you get this? That is why the Persians bestowed on him the title Patriarch. You're looking at the sarcophagus of Alexander the Great. Discovered this in Istanbul. The Greeks called him Lord and Legislator. The Jews entitled him Messiah of God. And the Muslims gave him the title Zolgarnain, possessor of two centuries. A righteous servant of God and the possessor of the first empire with the Freedom Charter. How do you like this? He was also the first king who struggled for the peaceful coexistence of diverse nations. The UN is using his principles of peaceful coexistence. He was the much-loved king who preserved in his heart the love for a single spouse. How's that? <laughs> so different. Till he passed away. The unique king whose human rights decree made Persia's name eternal. How does the Bible depict this great man in prophecy? What does the Bible call him? Shepherd, anointed, title of honor, set captives free. All these titles also belong to Jesus. Cyprus penned the following thoughts. All men have their frailties. Yes, it's correct. And whoever looks for a friend without imperfections, will never find what he seeks. So you think you can get a perfect wife or a perfect husband. Sarah says, they do not exist. We love ourselves, notwithstanding our faults. And we ought to love our friends in like manner. You know, these are deep thoughts. You cannot be buried in obscurity. You are exposed upon a grand theater of the view of the world. If your actions are upright and benevolent, be assured they will augment your power and happiness. When I read this, I thought of Paul. 
he speaks of us being a spectacle. The Greek says uh, theatron. We are theater and the universe looks upon us. Where this man got the insights, I don't know. What, a, what valuable advice did he give his son? Maybe you've got a son. What advice did you give your son? Listen to, to Cyrus. And you, Cambyses, you know yourself without words from me that your kingdom is not guarded by this golden scepter, his position. What do you think would guard your kingdom? And this is a message for all the rulers in the world. I don't know if they know what uh, Cyrus told his son to do, but this is words of wisdom. And you, Cambyses, you know of yourself without words of me that your kingdom is not guarded by this golden scepter, but by faithful friends. Faithful friends. So important to have a faithful friend. Their loyalty is your true staff, a scepter which shall not fail. May our kindness to people be the scepter by which we rule over them. I'm standing on top of Golgotha, Calvary, in Jerusalem. At the cross of Calvary, love and selfishness stood face to face. Here was their crowning manifestation. What did Jesus manifest? Forgiveness for dying for me and giving me eternal life. Like Cyrus, he was seeking faithful, loving followers. What was Satan demonstrating? Hatred, destruction of God and all his creatures. So Jesus and Cyrus appealed to us to be kind to every person we meet. A loving and a lovable Christian is the greatest argument in favor of Christianity. Little drops of water, little grains of sand makes the mighty ocean and makes the mighty land. Just be kind to everybody you meet. Christ's believing people are to perpetuate his love. This love is to draw them together around the cross. It is to divest them of all selfishness that bind them to God and to one another. The unselfish lives of Cyrus and Jesus challenge us to be kind to people. Listen to some of his dying words to his son Cambyses. But never think that loyal hearts grow up by nature as the grass grows in the field. If that were so, the same men would be loyal to all alike, even as natural objects are the same to all mankind. No, every leader must win his own followers for himself. And the way to win them is not by violence, but by loving kindness. He reminds me of what Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 12, the last verse, I think. He says, do not overcome evil by evil. Overcome evil with good. Change the negative into something positive. And if you would seek for friends, he said to his son Cambyses, to stand by you and guard your throne, whoso fit it be the first of them, as he who is sprung from the selfsame loins. Beautiful words. Remember my last saying, Cambyses, show kindness to your friends. And then shall you have it in your power 
to chastise your enemies. <laughs> this is fantastic. It's biblical. It was a type of Christ. <clears throat> no, no wonder the Bible calls Cyrus a type of a greater deliverer, Jesus Christ. This picture I took next to his tomb. And then closing words. Goodbye, my dear sons. He had two sons. Bid your mother goodbye for me and all my friends who are here or far away. Goodbye. And with these words, he gave his hand to them. And then he covered his face and died. While standing here at the Euphrates, which God and Cyrus caused to die, a thought came to me. The deliverance of the Jews would happen 70 years after 605. Siege of Jerusalem, when Nebuchadnezzar first took captives from Jerusalem to Babylon. I read this again, so important. The deliverance of the Jews would happen 70 years after the date 605 BC. That was the first time Jerusalem was besieged. And when Nebuchadnezzar took the captives to Babylon. So you have to count 70 years from 605 to the destruction of Babylon. This would bring us to 537 BC. What happened two years before Cyrus proclaimed the decree of deliverance? The Euphrates dried up two years before he proclaimed freedom. Look at the chronology. While visiting the ruins of ancient Haran, I thought of a similar prophecy of deliverance made to Abram. The Lord said he would make him a great nation. I took this sign at Hebron. Thirty years later at Hebron, the Lord repeated these promises, but added some bad news to the good news. To his visiting the tomb. Then the Lord said to him, that's Abram, you can be sure of what I'm about to tell you. Your children who live after you will be strangers in a country that does not belong to them. They will become slaves. They will be treated badly for 400 years. Hmm. I wonder how Abram reacted to this. Do they have to go through all this? My posterity? But this is the good news. There's always good news in the Bible. But I will punish the nation. And this, uh, of course, was Egypt. That makes them slaves. I want to just show you the parallel between the slaves in Babylon and the slaves in Egypt. After that, they will leave with all kinds of valuable things. Were these prophecies fulfilled? Please look at my series on the Exodus. Well, let's go to Egypt. Here at the ancient site of Afaris, where the Pharaoh ruled, a voice was heard on the 14th day of Nisan, 1450, that's March. The people of Israel lived in Egypt for 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, all of the Lord's people marched out of Egypt like an army. Perfect fulfillment of a promise made to Abraham, prophecy. Did they face a similar challenge that Cyrus faced before they were totally freed from their bondage? Yes, the Bible has parallels. And the one section takes you to another section and the puzzle becomes understandable. While standing here at the Euphrates, which God and Cyrus caused to drop, a thought came to me. You know, sometimes we have to stand still a little while and let the surroundings speak to you. 
The people of Israel went through the sea on dry ground. There was a wall of water on their right side and on their left. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. This was the mightiest military exercise of the day. It covered the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the people of Israel into the sea. Not one of the Egyptians was left. So what happened to the enemies of God's people who wanted to destroy them? And what will happen to people who want to destroy you? This is the place where Israel walked through the Red Sea. It's called Ein El Ein Sokna. The only place where you have a mountain range coming into the sea. What will happen to God's people at the end of this world's history when seven last plagues will be poured out? While standing here at the Euphrates, which God and Cyrus caused to dry up, a thought came to me. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Parallels. What will happen to God's people at the end of this world's history? Our heavenly Cyrus is on his way to come and rescue us from the final persecution of Satan and his followers. While walking on the footsteps of Cyrus, I reminded Loretta of someone else in the Bible whose coming was announced 282 years before his birth. It happened right here at Bethel, where Jacob the fugitive had a vision of God's forgiving grace. By the way, this king had another shrine at Tel Dan, where he also erected two golden calves. He got this from Egyptian theology. Let's ask these ancient stones to tell us what was wrong in his establishing new sites for worship. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now this occasion was one of importance because Jero, Jer, Jeroboam, son of Solomon, was officiating as priest at the dedication of the new altar at Bethel. Now what was wrong in what he was doing? Have a good look at the ruins of Bethel. If you have a minute, just read what he says here. You know what the Bible predicted was fulfilled right here. Let's visit the sites which are mentioned in this description. This is uh, the place where Jacob slept with a stone as a pillar. And this is where he had a vision of the angels descending and ascending up the ladder which linked the earth and heaven. And you know, while this poor fugitive, Jacob, he gave upon himself. He was revealed the character of God and it changed his life. And if you and I have a better appreciation of God's character and his love and forgiveness, it will change our lives. And I discover God in the Old Testament. I discover him in the New Testament. Here we're looking at the ruins of Jeroboam's temple, son of Solomon. The dimensions uh, matches that of the tabernacle of Moses. You see, he wanted to make almost a similar place of worship than that of Jerusalem. And he drew the people with him into destruction. Jeroboam built an altar at Bethel. He offered sacrifices on it. He sacrificed to the calves he had made. He also put priests in Bethel. He did it at the high places he had made. Here you're looking at the site. You know, he was trying to invest it with sanctity 
that would win for it the respect and homage of the people to prevent them to go to Jerusalem and worship over there. How would God rebuke the king's bold defiance? 1 Kings 12, 32. Jeroboam built an altar at Bethel. He offered sacrifices on it. He sacrificed to the calves he had made. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Now this is the prophet's uh, warning. So what did the Lord say? Behold a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you, referring to the altar, he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places and burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. You know, the Lord does not often predict the future with such definite detail as to point out the specific actors. I wonder if the king was skeptic when he listened to this shocking prediction. Now, just as Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus would come after almost 200 years to rescue his people from the influence of the degrading Babylonians, so too did Isaiah predict the coming of Josiah to do a similar work 282 years later. King Jeroboam listens to the prophet of God that predicts the doom of the altar. At this stage he was sacrificing at this altar. So what went through the mind of this wicked king of Israel when God revealed to him his awful sins? This was a time for him to repent. And the Lord gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. Jeroboam may have thought that the prediction of this prophet was a bit far-fetched. Now would the altar split, the ashes drop down. Come on, prophet, don't try and sell me this nonsense. So that Jeroboam and the people might be impressed that the man of God was a true prophet and that his message of warning carried weight. He gave a striking prophecy which would be immediately fulfilled. Listen to this. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar of Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, Arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. Can you see the shock on the face of Jeroboam when he looked at his withered arm? You cannot mess with God, my friend. God will not let him be degraded. And what else happened at this very moment? The altar also split apart, as the prophet said would happen. And the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. You know, this manifestation of the Lord's presence and power was something that could not be successfully gainsay. This was God speaking. Instead of being persuaded of the solemnity of the altar and the sanctity of their priestly king, the people now realized that Jeroboam was acting in direct defiance of heaven and bringing upon himself the divine rebuke. When did this happen? In the year 931 BC, at the beginning of Jeroboam's reign. Look at the date. When did the prophecy of the birth of Josiah came true? When he was born 
649 BC. Let these stones tell you what happened 280 years later after the confrontation between the prophet and the king Jeroboam. It was in the year 622 BC. King Josiah was doing his work of reform and destroying the detestable heathen temples and altars. This is what happened when he came to Bethel after 282 years after the prophecy had been given. Moreover, the altar was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made. Both that altar and the high place he broke down. So he has a fulfilling of that prophecy. Same as the one concerning the drying up of the river Euphrates and the fall of Babylon. And he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain and he sent and took the bones of the tombs and burned them on the altar. A prediction came true after 282 years. And he fouled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed to him 282 years before, who proclaimed these words. You know, it's important to study prophecy, especially the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. If these prophecies came true, we have to take heed of the prophecies telling us about what's going to happen at the end of time. Burning human bones were very offensive. What God predicted about the destruction of the wicked altar at Bethel came true. Were all the time prophecies of the Old Testament fulfilled? Yes. The prophecies concerning the end time mystery of Babylon will also be fulfilled. Utter destruction. There's no future for this planet. After warning the world for 120 years of a worldwide flood that would destroy the planet, the prophecy was fulfilled. I've been to the place where the ark landed, Ucht Asar. How many people were saved of the millions? What happened when the 430 year prophecy of Israel's deliverance was fulfilled at the Red Sea? The obedient were saved, the wicked were destroyed. This is going to happen again. What happened just before the 70 year prophecy concerning the deliverance of God's people by Cyrus was fulfilled? And what will happen? when the 1,500 prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus will be fulfilled. He will come and take us to a crime-free, pain-free, guilt-free heaven to enjoy his love and friendship throughout eternity. I want to be ready to meet him on that climatic day, that climatic event. What about you, my friend? Father in heaven, thank you for studying the fulfilled prophecies of ancient times by your ancient prophets. May this be an incentive for us to study the prophecies and get ready for the crime-free world that's waiting at the second coming. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here, then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.